Good morning, everyone. We welcome you to our Saturday morning Bible study. This morning is November 25th, 2017. We are recording from the Plainfield Christian Science Church Independent in Plainfield, New Jersey, the United States of America. Okay, this morning our moderator is Linda from Pennsylvania, who today is in New Jersey. Good morning. I'm going to start by a quote from Miscellaneous Writings by Mary Baker Eddy. Quote, Your dual and impersonal pastor, the Bible and science and health with key to the scriptures, is with you. And the life these give, the truth they illustrate, and the love they demonstrate, is the great shepherd that feedeth my flock and leadeth them beside the still waters. End quote. Just beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you. That's good. So this morning, uh, we're going to change it up a little bit. Uh, we're going to actually go line by line. And so if there's anybody who wants to volunteer to read one of the lines, I'll start since I already have it here in front of me with the first line. I know we had three questions. Oh, we'll go verse by verse. Verse by verse, by excuse verse. me. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to read from Psalm 23, the King James Version, the first verse. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Any comments? Any thoughts? We have everything we need. There, you know, there isn't any reason to want. God provides everything that we are needing right now, so we have no want. I think we have no. Go ahead, Lauren. We have no want because of the shepherd. So I think the fact that we have a shepherd comes first in my thought. Yes. <laughs> Certainly no reason to have waited in line for Black Friday or... <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely an appropriate verse, especially for this time of year where the advertising is so aggressive to make you feel like you're dissatisfied and that you need something. That's not what God says. Is that we're all his beloved children. We have everything we need. There's no room for discontent. I found this beautiful line in Spurgeon. <coughs> the wicked always want, but the righteous never. Thank you. And they're very, always very unsatisfied and, co and complaining. It's a very miserable way to live, to feel that you are controlled by wanting things, rather than coming under the jurisdiction of the of the shepherd. Now that's one thing Jim, he would often say in his testimonies at the end, thank you shepherd. <laughs> he always would acknowledge God as the shepherd. I read something beautiful about this psalm with someone who was very, very ill with a problem. And he said he repeated this psalm from 20 to 200 times a day. And he said it was in an effort to change his mind from one of total despair, negativity, and fear. And at first, the, they were just words. But he said after a while, when he kept replacing all his negativity and fear with the idea of God being a shepherd that's caring for me, it changed, and he began to feel the truth that was in the psalm. And after about a, a year's time, guess what happened? He was healed. He was healed. Now, we have said here, you know, to read Signs of Health, Prose Works, the Bible, through, chronologically. If you're not healed, read it again. Certainly Signs of Health. But I thought this was a lovely thought because there's such depth to this psalm. And a couple of years ago, Parthen sent me a book. It was by a W. Philip Keller. 
If you don't have it, you really should get it. It's just a little book, but it is an amazing little book. He was a very, very spiritually minded man, and the name of the book is A Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23. He was a shepherd. He, he was born in East Africa, but, and he observed the shepherding there. And then he, I think he moved to Canada, and he, he raised sheep. And we'll go through it because it is so important. I know we talked about it a couple of years ago, but it's worth repeating. Because the similarities, embarrassingly enough, between sheep and people are quite astounding. <laughs> and also, what he brought out, the tremendous love a shepherd has to have to watch over. This isn't just, you know, you're just wandering around every day looking at your sheep. It's, it's an incredible job, and we'll go through what it, what it takes and why this, these, each verse is so rich in meaning. Very, very un important to understand this. So you have a relationship with your shepherd. As Florence said, that's if you don't understand your shepherd and how much he loves you, it's hard to have a relationship with him. And of course, these sheep, when there was a good shepherd, these sheep, totally devoted to the good shepherd. They're also bad shepherds. And those, she and those sheep were in in pitiful condition. So I, any, anyone else, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Well, and, and also, it was one of the primary occupations at that time. You know, we were a very agrarian society then. You didn't have manufacturing, you didn't have accountants, you didn't have lawyers. <laughs> People were either farmers or shepherds to a large extent. And there were good shepherds and bad shepherds, as Mary mentioned. And so it was part of everybody's daily life to know what a good shepherd was. And I think it's very interesting that being a shepherd is all of the preparations that David needed Goliath. He had everything from that. That's a very That's good, good point. point. All he had been ever he had been a shepherd, and yet he was able to defeat Goliath. Mm -hmm. He didn't go to you know all these schools. Didn't have all these degrees. It's all he needed. He cared enough about the sheep to battle the bear and the lion for the sake of saving sheep. Yes. That's, that's yes. really that that is the love that a good shepherd has, and um, you know you you will always have everything, every good thing you need. But what is the requirement? We're going, We're going to, to listen and obedience, yes. follow humility, and and to know that God is your shepherd. To recognize God as your shepherd. Yes. Recognize mm -hmm. God as your shepherd. And, and not my will, but thine. Right. And then when you get to this sense of knowing how much he loves you, then you have this complete devotion and love for him, as the sheep did. And also as his dog, his shepherd, shepherding dog, Lass, did. In another book, he tells of that relationship. But um, incredible relationship between the two. And that's how our relationship with God should be. I mean, he would say with the dog, all he'd have to do is, you know, give the dog a look. And the dog would become, know exactly what he wanted and become obedient to that. That's how our relationship with God should be. We should feel so close and in tune to him. He doesn't have to shout at us. Just gives a, us a look. Just gives us a look. <laughs> and just the slightest thing will get us back thinking, well, what is your will, Father? What would you have me do? That oneness of mind. The thing that's uh, unfortunate for the sheep is is that they can convert to vegetation that humans can't into food that humans can eat, which is the sheep. So that's 
one of the big reasons to uh, do a good job there, so taking care of your sheep and protecting them from uh, being stolen or eaten by other animals. Yeah, he brings out the tremendous, uh, a good fold of sheep, the tremendous good, all that they produce. An, an amazing, amazing uh, amount with their wool and um, also the way they, when they're properly cared for, the way they keep the uh, ground, the grass. And it's a wonderful example of reciprocal love. I think something else struck me with how the shepherds take care of their sheep. It's not just the, the sheep, but individually. They said that in the evening he would take each one and examine if there was anything wrong, you know, they were hurt in any way. And I thought that was so beautiful, the way I think we should also think about how individually God knows us and cares for each one. Thank you very much, yes. Yes, he would examine each sheep every day. Anyone else on this? Well, I just wanted to uh, say thank you to the lesson writer because when I was going through this, there were five psalms in this lesson, and actually every single one of them was written by David. And it was so beautiful the way this came at this time of year because it was a psalm, Psalm 34 was thanking the goodness of the Lord. Psalm 18 was a grateful retrospection. And then uh, Psalm 20 was unwavering confidence in God. And Psalm 37 was um, how the righteous are preserved and how they just tie in so beautifully with this time of year, with this psalm. It's just, it's just awes me. Thank you. It was fairly who wrote it. She's not here today. Hopefully she'll be listening to this one. Right. So are we ready Hello? to read? Hello? Hello, Tom. Hi, Tom. Oh, yeah. So um, I think when it says the Lord is my shepherd, that it's uh, telling us something that's very, very important. And that is that um, we are not independent. So if we think that we're smart enough or we're strong enough that we can take care of ourselves, it's telling us that uh, we're never going to be smart enough or strong enough or clever enough to take care of ourselves. Um, we, we need this shepherd. And that shepherd is the Lord, so it's not just any shepherd. Thank you. That's a very good point. Excellent point. Absolutely. It actually relates to our church, because we call our church independent. But this kind of independence is more dependent on God. God alone. Absolutely. Thank you. We are dependent on God. God alone. Very important point. Can't do anything without the shepherd. I mean, you think of how helpless a one sheep is or a lamb. They're totally helpless. They could fall prey to all kinds of things, as we'll find out as we continue. And they do. And, and then the Antichrist comes along and says that you need to lean on something else as your shepherd. Like your doctor or your government or your something else. Or your trustees. Or your spouse. Board of directors. Or your board of directors and boss. This is a quote from Miscellaneous Writings from the beginning. The Bible in Science and Health is the impersonal pastor. It is the great shepherd that feedeth the flock. So our pastor is the Word of God, inspired Word in the Bible, provides for every need that we ever have, instead of leaning on someone else's opinion or someone else's demonstration. Some personal pastor is our guider. Guides us. Thank you, Tom, for that. Yeah, it's a very important one. Thank you. 
it's uh, very interesting a couple of comments that were just made because when I was farming, I was very, very observant. My sister and I had a partnership, and we were very observant on the animals and as uh, was pointed out, looked at them every day and handled them every day. The trouble was then turned over our care to a veterinarian versus to God, which was a problem. Yeah, thank you. An example. It, it, it Sometimes you feel like it takes more work to know that God is your shepherd and to turn to him for everything. But ultimately, it is not more work. You'll spend a lot of wasted time on doctor bills and tromping around hospitals and all of this. But if you can really know God is your shepherd and be always turning to him for everything, it's quite a wonderful life. It's so much less work because you're going to one source that has all the answers, not here, there, and everywhere. Thank you very much. That's it in a nutshell. <laughs> the one source that has all the answers for everything, whatever it is, relationship problems, you want to lose weight, <laughs> you want to learn more about life, health problems, whatever your problem is, our answers in God. And this is why Mrs. Eddie says, don't let the sense of lack stay with you for even, two, I think, two seconds or something, because we shouldn't. God is here. We can turn to him instead of staying with that false sense that I don't have something. Thank you. Yes, this, this is the answer to financial needs. You shall not want if God is your shepherd. So the question is, is he? if you are financially in trouble. <coughs> and if you think he is, then maybe you need to think a little deeper. Okay. Do we have any volunteers to read the second verse? I'll read it. He okay. make it... He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Well, um, I found something in Science and Health that was very interesting to me because my first understanding of this years ago when I was under the teaching of the Boston, I thought this was personal peace, comfort, human peace, the human goodness, and and <clears throat> I, I'm finding out living here that the only true peace comes from standing up to air. And in Science and Health, from our last lesson, actually, page 514, she says that moral courage is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And then it goes on to say, undisturbed it lies in the open field or rest in green pastures besides the still waters. That was really profound to me. Well, also to go along with that, that um, sheep will not lie down until they're secure and feel safe. Otherwise, they stay on their, their feet. If God gives us everything we need, then we can be secure our as we have handled animal magnetism. With moral courage. With moral courage. Then we can lie down in the green pasture. I mean, in those days, in this part of the world, green pastures were kind of a rarity. There's a lot of desert. If you had a green pasture, it was worth a lot. But you didn't dare lie down until you were safe. Well, thank you. Those, those were beautiful. And 
in this little book, this shepherd, Philip Keller, says that as Shardy was bringing out, that sheep will not lie down and then we, unless they feel it's feeling secure. So we apply it to ourselves when we can't sleep. He said that they have to be free of all fear. They have to be free from friction with others. They have to be free of pests. And they have to be free from hunger. So you think about it when you go to sleep. If, if you're afraid of something, chances are you can't sleep. And he brings out how the, this good shepherd goes around and finds any predators and takes care of them, he and his sheep dogs. So are we knowing that as we lay down that our shepherd is with us? There's nothing to fear. And then free from friction with others. He brought out, you know, that I didn't know this, but some sheep can be bullies. They'll go and intimidate another sheep and they'll buy for who's the strongest or best. And, you know, in your own life, if you're having friction with other people, it's, you can try to sleep at night and you're going round and around with stuff and, and you, you can't. It's ungodly. So he tells here, he said, once, once the shepherd enters the scene where the sheep are fighting with each other, they all what? Yeah, they all stop. <laughs> the presence of the shepherd stops the friction and irritation. And then pests. There can be all kinds of pests in your life. <laughs> but he refers to that saying something is bugging you. You've got to take care of that. You can't have anything bugging you. And, of course, the sheep would often be afflicted with all kinds of pests, which the shepherd had to heal and take care of. And then, finally, hunger. And God provides us with all good things so that we are properly nourished and not hungry. But last night, when I was trying, I was having trouble getting to sleep. I thought, I thought of this, and I thought, hmm, I need to realize the presence of the shepherd. Whatever was trying to keep me awake, that the Christ power was with me, and I did fall asleep. And that word "make it," I didn't look it up. I don't know if anyone could look it up, but. Um, he maketh me to lie down. So I guess what does that mean? He makes it comfortable so you can lie down, right? Enables. He enables. He doesn't force you, but he enables and makes it safe so you can lie down in peace and comfort. And there are many beautiful things in Psalms also about lying down and sleeping and having no fear. Beautiful statement of truth. I was thinking about the still waters, and I realized that a still water is not totally motionless or dead water because bad things grow in water that's not moving somewhat. And then on the other hand, it's not violently in excess. So what this meant to me was that God provides just the right stream of right thoughts for me and feel his presence that he can make things right, and it comes just in the right way. It's not inactive, it's not dead, it's not a torrent rush that is all disturbed. It's the right stream of God's thoughts feeding each and every one of us. Yeah, and when there's a stream, it's constantly purifying itself. And the idea of the green pastures, too, that they're always fresh, they're always rich, they're never exhausted green pastures, so we can never be exhausted. Uh, there's always, we're going to that fount, again, finding the shepherd, the source of all being. It also shows the shepherd's care because sheep don't like rushing water. They don't want to 
get into it to drink or go near it, really. So the still waters is also the preference for them. Well, and, and it, this was interesting, too, in this book, because he said there were three sources of the fresh water. And he did say, as, as Bruce brought out, if you get, you know, muddy, terrible water, it could, it's not a good thing. But he said that the early morning dew was one source, deep wells and springs and streams. But he said that the early morning dew was one of the best ways for the sheep to get water. Fresh and clean early morning dew. And he said he'd always be so happy to look out in the early morning and see the sheep taking in not only nourishment, but water, right? Early morning dew is a beautiful thought. And then he likens it to us. So early, early in the morning, what should we be doing? Starting. We should be reading our lesson. We should be taking in that early morning dew. Our lesson... All the things we're taught, our daily duties, our communion with God, singing Him. There's nothing like the early morning. Any of you have come to appreciate that time. He brings it out, but that's, that's what we need, and we mustn't forget or neglect to do it. Because if we do, what will happen? We're going to lose our green pastures and still water. Yeah. Oh, we get started. Our on thought is not confused already. Yeah, you just get started on the wrong foot. Stuck in the vacuum of mortal mind where bad things can grow, and that's followed by this terrible rush of something destructive that follows. You don't have the order of God. Yes. Yeah. You're not fortified. have to be fortified. The Evans used to teach this that, you know, first thing in the morning, your consciousness is kind of like an empty vessel. So what are you going to fill it with, first thing? You're going to fill it with the truth, have a strong foundation for your day, or are you going to fill it with garbage and suffer the consequences? So it's important what you fill your consciousness with, first thing in the morning. You know, still waters, to the still waters, they run deep. So much of our, our love for God, our time with God, should run deep, not a superficial. Oops, i got to read my lesson, I'll do it in five minutes, dash out the door. Let it run deep. This is time well spent, and you will find your shepherd. As Lillian said, the source of all good, nothing else but your shepherd. Anybody else? Well, I found another place where Mrs. Eddy refers to this in Miscellany, page 129. Quote, the divine law gives to man health and everlasting life, ev life everlasting, gives a soul to soul, a present harmony wherein the good man's heart takes hold on heaven and whose feet can never be moved. These are his green pastures beside still waters where faith mounts upward, expiates, strengthens, and exults. End quote. Perfect, thank you. It is beautiful. The green pastures. The still waters. What was the page of that? Page 129, miscellaneous. Anyone else? Okay. 
we have any volunteers to read the third verse? I will. Uh, he restores my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. restores my soul. That is a soul always, and it's coming back. It's not like you're getting a new soul, but restoring it. Yeah, he renews life. Things seem a little down. Picks you up. Gives you something good to do. Gives you all you need to do it. That's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know, you know, after the way I was living before and I got to that real low point, I just felt I was just worthless, just garbage. So to find out that's not true, that's like the best guess ever. So. This verse also has meant a lot to me because. There have been times when I've been led into doing the wrong things and realized I needed to get back to my God when I did the right thing to repent. I could feel his presence again. It's like, so you see, this ever-present love really is here all the time. You just got to get in tune with it. And then, after that, I found that he would lead me to do the right things, but the right things for his purpose, not for the right things that I thought were good like I wanted. That's just not much. Well, and he teaches us right from wrong. I mean, it's pretty basic. It's the divine right to know right from wrong. I think I like the restore of my soul because it's like we will always be remembered or taken back to who we really are, our real identity. If we obey, if we listen, he will restore us, bring us back to what we've always been and we always are. But the false senses, of course, tell us we are not this and we are not that. And that's just beautiful to me. It is, that's absolutely right. So when we feel dragging, God, it is God that revives us. Again, we turn to him. In the, in the book, he talks about sheep. They're called cast sheep. And they, are, they get overburdened with something, maybe too much <coughs> wool or <coughs> what, whatever, it, and it causes them to fall down. Sometimes they want to lie down, maybe when they shouldn't. But then they can't get back up. And he says the good shepherd is always having to watch for this because it could it could mean death in a day or two for the sheep. So they're always going and looking for any sheep that are cast. Another word we could say is cast down. And then when he finds them, he puts them back up. And then they're safe again. But it's something, again, the shepherd is always watching over us see if any of us are cast down for some reason. Our soul, our spirit is dragging. And he comes and sets us right. Um, says in the book, wool in scripture depicts the old self-life in the Christian. It is the outward expression of an in, inner attitude, the assertion of my own desire and hopes and aspirations. It is the area of my life in which and through which I am continually in contact with the world around me. Here is where I find the clinging accumulation of things, the possession of worldly ideas beginning to weigh me down, drag me down, and hold me down. It is significant that no high priest was ever allowed to wear wool when he entered the Holy of Holies. 
This spoke of self, of pride, of personal preference, and God could not tolerate it. So you see, then we need our soul restored because we've been out in the world <laughs> and accumulating the mesmerism of that world. And the Good Shepherd comes, cleanses us of it, and restores our soul if we're willing and obedient to that shepherd to have it done. But as, as it's the example of the sheep, if it's not done, it'll take you out. And it might happen quickly. So this season, as we've talked about, is a season where there's a lot of materiality. And uh, <coughs> stay in the secret place of the Most High. Abide by the still waters and the green pastures and keep your soul nourished in the truth. Who else? Anyone? I like the part about he leads us in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Um, one of the places that I looked up in Biblos, in the commentaries, was saying that first we had to have our soul restored. Or, and, and Mrs. Eddy, when she has the um, 23rd Psalm and adds the word love, she changes the word soul to a spiritual sense. And when we have that renewed, then we're ready. Anyway, this writer was saying that once our soul is restored, we're able to do God, whatever God wants us to do to work for him. And um, that he's leading us in a, in a way that is best for us to work for whatever God wants us to do for him and for the world. Absolutely. Thank you. That's a good point. Because how do we hear God? Through our spiritual self. And no other way. Yeah, we talk about the need the need to cultivate our spiritual sense. To respect it. To obey it. To trust it. And I read that it said when you are righteous, you are actually honoring God. That's what we meant. Yeah, because when you're honoring God, what are you honoring? You're honoring life. You're honoring the truth. <laughs> you're honoring principle. You're honoring love, divine love. You can't argue with that. And you're honoring his allness and supremacy. Exactly. So, you know, it's so important that we love this shepherd that loves us so much and we're willing to follow him, to follow the Christ. You know, many, many of us, Christians and Christian scientists, so-called, say they're following Christ, but then you ask yourself questions. Are you really? Are you really just willing to sacrifice self and selfishness? Sacrifice having your own way, your willfulness? Uh, I, I often refer myself and others to Mrs. Eddy's article, Faith Cure, in her chapter, Retrospection and Introspection, because she asks those questions. You just want the quick healing, or are you willing to drop all for Christ? And if you're not, then don't call yourself a Christian scientist. You have to at least do it in some respect, and you have to have a lot enough love to do it, to care about somebody else, mankind, more than you care about yourself. And in losing your life, what happens? You find it. You find it. You gain everything. Yes. You gain everything. But this is following in these paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And it's a glorious path. And it's also a plain path when you were 
talking to your shepherd every day. It's not difficult to find it. In the book, he, he lists a whole list of things, but I'm not going to read them all, but touched upon them, as did you touch upon them, all of you spoke. Go ahead, Mike. Betty. Oh, Betty. Okay, sorry, Betty. I was just thinking about when we hear the namesake, is sometimes it's a good idea to change that to nature. So we learn to change, or actually we put on our real nature <laughs> in God's man rather than in the human mind. Yes. Are we ready to have uh, someone a volunteer for the fourth verse? <clears throat> okay, I'll read. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thank you. Okay, the first part. Walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. That shadow of death seems really real until you realize the shepherd's there. Yeah. It's interesting he calls it a shadow. There's no real substance to a lie. Yeah. And it has no claim over anyone. Yeah, it's just a shadow. There's no real substance to it. And and somewhere I read, if there if there's a shadow that shows there's also what? The real the I you know. Yeah. Like it's and and also light. There's the light. There's the light. So there's the reality and the light, and there's a shadow. As you're walking through, you keep walking through. Don't stop. Look around. Just keep moving. Thank you. Very important. That's absolutely right. You walk through. You don't linger or stop or go backwards. Look back. Yeah. And you look back. Question. Question. Mm -hmm. Sorry for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> keep walking. Yeah. Yeah, like Winston Churchill said, when you're going through hell, keep going. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. When you're going through hell, keep going. <laughs> but when you know God loves you, when there's no doubt in your mind, that fills you with love. And uh, what does John say? Perfect love casteth out fear. When the love of God is in your heart, you can't be afraid. It's impossible. That's really That's helpful to think that because you wonder sometimes these trials that people went through, like Mrs. Eddy, I just never thought of it that deeply, that it was her love for God that kept her going through these. Yeah, I, I find it very helpful. When, whenever I feel fearful, whenever I feel afraid, reality check. What am I not loving? Great. Yeah, this it's also a very, when you feel, well, when I used to feel so insecure, this time was really, I, I was just happy that I was made to learn it by heart because it was the, really the only comfort, like to know that, no, God is here, God is with me. Yes. And he 
says the sheep feel that way also when they're walking in any, you know, darkness or anything. And the only comfort is the fact that the shepherd is with them. They were all quiet, but they knew the presence of the shepherd, and that gave them comfort to walk on. That's absolutely right. They would, as long as the shepherd was with them, they were never afraid. They had such trust in the shepherd. And the shepherd has two instruments, a rod and a staff. Anybody know what those are used for? Yes, I had a lot of fun with them. <laughs> that rod, according to what I read, that's a short stick for defense. Mm-hmm. And he also, you know, well, that was protection for them, too. Mm-hmm. Now, the staff was more of an instrument. And on the rod, they also um, used for climbing. And then the staff was for leaning upon. And also, uh, with that hook, he could, he could grab the sheep and, and protect them also. So it was a dual thing going on with both those instruments. And those sheep knew that their shepherd had them mm-hmm. and trusted. Uh, Mm-hmm. And I, I like to think that God has a rod and a staff for us. He's got a rod to kind of whack us over the head when, <laughs> when we stray <laughs> out of love. And then he's got the staff, is the, 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 the truth that he's always feeding us, that guides us. As one guy put it in the the thing was was like he can use that to poke and prod us to get us to go in the right direction and away from the wrong direction. <laughs> yeah, and that's what a loving parent does, isn't it? Yeah. What a loving shepherd does. You know, um when I read that, um I think of um, I think sometimes that um, it's easy to come up with a false standard for a Christian scientist. You know, it's a Christian scientist that um, I'm doing everything right, and of course my health is perfect. Of course I have no issues. Of course I have no problems. Um, so that is the standard for a Christian scientist, and. You know, um, try and find someone who lives that standard. Good luck. It'd be pretty hard to find someone who can live that standard. But if we're having issues or problems or or whatever, um, it's what do we do? And if we uh, are fearful um, or uh, we don't turn to God, I think that's the standard that Christian science should have is, no, it says here, I will fear no evil. And um, as we, as I mentioned before about how this Psalm 23 starts out, uh, we should be turning to God. So that's the standard I think that Christian science should be lived to. Yeah, our standard is always in the Beatitudes and in, in living. It's just our motive, how we're living it. That's our standard. That's what we check ourselves for. And problems are stepping stones, aren't they? Yeah. <clears throat> Trials are proof of God's care. They're not a badge of... Dishonor. A dishonor. Opportunity. They are opportunities. We are working our salvation out. If 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 we see them that way. But I remember growing up in a Boston affiliated church. And I remember when people had problems. Some of them actually felt guilty about it. And it paralyzed them. And I remember the feeling. It it was horrible. And it 
it's not Christian science. Yeah, the, the standard is perfect God, perfect man, perfect universe. But we work out our problems. We don't sweep them under the rug or become ashamed of them. Yeah. Because that personalizes them. And that's not Christian science. And it is a lot of pride, and I remember I used to feel it. Goodness knows I wasn't going to let anybody know I was having a problem. I was too prideful. I was worried of criticism, all of that. It's a terrible way to live, and it is not Christian science. Like Adam hid. Yeah, Adam hid. That personal sense rises up, pride and then shame, because they go hand in hand. Prideful, then you're ashamed. One thing I, I thought was interesting, this was in Matthew Henry, and this was in last week's lesson, and I, I never heard it explained exactly like this, but about the child putting his hand on the cockatrice's den, which is, you know, like a, something terrible, a dragon or something. And, and um, Matthew Henry said he's, he's bidding a holy defiance to death. So again, that is... Because God is with us, we will fear no evil. We will not be afraid of death. You know, they say that the soldiers, the people that fight the fiercest, are those who aren't afraid of death, right? We must be willing to fight fiercely for a righteous cause. And not fear the consequences. And not fear the consequences. If we don't, this is how evil gets a foothold, foothold, stronghold. When we back down because we're afraid, because air is a bully, it'll bully you. You've got to rise up in rebellion against it, as Mr. Betty said. So, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Whatever it's trying to claim, whatever it's bullying you about, you've got the power and might of God on your side, and that's the only side, but you have to claim it, and you have to know he is your shepherd. Okay, the next. Any volunteers for verse 5? I'll read it. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. It covers a lot, then. The phrase that come to mind with this one. And it usually doesn't, but today it just, I'm coming home, is what that made me feel like, to my rightful place. Thank you. That's a lovely thought. That's a lovely thought. And it doesn't matter where you are or what your circumstances are, does it? Mm-mm. God is preparing a table for you. can be in the middle of the fiercest battle. Yeah, right. God feeds you. Yeah, even in the midst of your enemies, he's preparing a, a table. And in the in the book, he said that, that amongst all the good food for the sheep, there would be these poisonous stuff. And that they, the shepherd would have to go out and pull up all the poison. Or it would kill the sheep. And that's a lot of love to do that, to go out. He said he would go out with his children. They would spend all day pulling up poisonous weeds or something. And uh, it shows a tremendous love. So, but to us, how do we apply that? Even where there might seem to be a great good, we have to be aware that there could be something poisonous or toxic using our spiritual sense not just gobbling everything up, <laughs> come what may. And he said, too, that a cougar, a cougar could come in and kill a lot of sheep and leave and leave and have absolutely 
zero uh, sense that he was he'd ever been there. He would leave no trail, nothing. But that's how that's again an example of how sneaky era is. How it <coughs> come into your thoughts and try to kill something, your inspiration, your joy, your devotion to God. And it leaves no trace. You wonder how how did that happen? It will inject itself somehow. But, but, we have a good shepherd who is watching over us. And he knows, and he sees. And how does he see this? He anointed my head with oil. What does Mrs. Eddie say about that? Heavenly inspiration, that oil. He overflows us with inspiration. He pours inspiration into our consciousness all the time. He's giving us more than we ever accept. Are we paying attention? But again, we let go to him every morning, early in the morning, for this fresh anointing. When he says, clad in the panoply of love, human hatred can never reach you. Yes. And for the sheep, this oil was a great benefit because it would... um, keep all the bugs away from them. They would sometimes fight and ram each other, you know, when they were mating. If they had a lot of oil, they they couldn't. They would hit each other. (laughs) So this oil protects us from all the annoying thoughts and bugs and all the, uh, perhaps, the friction that we would have with other people. You know, you think of something, some dart that someone might say to you, some mean thing. And if you're covered with oil, what'll happen? Slide right off. Slide right That's off. Awful. But water off a duck's back. <laughs> totally protected. But you have to, you can't let your oil fade, bro, so that you don't have it anymore. The story of the ten virgins. You've got to renew it. Refresh yourself with all this inspiration that God is pouring forth every day. But if you let it run out, whose fault is that? Wrong. Only your own. So here we have a picture of the Good Shepherd going, you know, we often say that Christ goes before us and prepares the way. Well, that's the Christ going before us and finding all the noxious weeds and killing all the cougars and (laughs) making everything bright and pleasant for us to go forward. And then, and then we have the anointing of the oil. So liberally that our cup runneth over. And we should feel that. If we don't, shame on us. Shame on us. That means we haven't spent enough time with the shepherd and we're not grateful for him. And what you're not grateful for, what will happen? You lose it. We'll lose it. <laughs> We'll lose it. And then all of a sudden you think, whoa, I've had a lot to be grateful for. It's very strange when you think of it that how many people never thank God for one tiny little thing, and yet when something goes wrong, who gets blamed? God. (laughs) God. What a travesty that is. And I'm sure I did it. Why we have our... Wednesday meeting, our cup should be overflowing. We never should come to a Wednesday meeting feeling that we have nothing to be grateful for. I read something from one of Spurgeon's um, interpretations. He said, my cup runneth over. If this is the case with your cup, dear friend, then let it run over in thankful joy. And if you have more of this world substance than you need, 
Ask the poor and needy to come and catch that which flows over. Mm, that's beautiful. Freely ye have received, freely give. Yeah. Uh, we do. We just have one more. Should we go ahead? Or? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead with one more. I'll just read it. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely is certainty. It's here. I like that. Yes, thank you. Certainty. It's quite a benediction, isn't it? The only thing that is eternal is goodness in God's mercy. I have something that made me chuckle. It's from uh, Belmolo in a commentary. He said, that goodness and mercy are like two angels determined to run me down and run after me. <laughs> <laughs> and keep you dwelling in this right. house. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They are constant companions, always with us. The sheep dog. <laughs> sheep dog, right. <laughs> Looking out for it. Uh, this verse was biblical authority for the fact that God is omnipresent. Yes. Goodness, all the goodness of God and mercy, his great love and his forgiveness. He'll be with us all places, all conditions, all the days of our life. I think it was Matthew Henry who said, that would be satisfied with fatness of God's house must keep close to the duties of it. So, it's always the requirement. I thought that was the beautiful thing about this lesson that it brought out was that Asa didn't do that. He, did, he didn't follow the obedience. He left it. But to me, that was bringing home this concept that you have to stay with God. And this little book brings out, what are you leaving behind? Are you leaving goodness and mercy behind wherever you go? He brings out that the sheep that are well managed, maintained, as, as Mike alluded to earlier, their pastures are beautiful. Um, you know, they have all this wonderful wool. They 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 are tremendous of tremendous blessing. And they are cared for, and when they love the shepherd, and they don't leave the fold. While sheep that are not taken proper care of, it's a most pathetic and sad picture. And everywhere they go, it's destructive. And it's, it's, it's the shepherd's fault. It's the bad shepherd. That's why. Where is that verse? That, that one of our chapters in the Bible about the good shepherd? Jeremiah, one of them. Anyway, he, he compares the good shepherd with the bad shepherd. But the poor sheep, and, the, and he, he would, this author would say he would look at this sheep and for a place where the shepherd was not taking care of them and how the sheep would look so longingly for his pastures. Sometimes they would try to slip through and get there. Um, but then the, the bad shepherd would come back for them. And he likens it to us. We stay in the Father's house. We will be in the good shepherd's pastures. But if we stray, we will seem to be ruled by a very wicked master. And the only way we can get back to the green pastures is how. Can't slip in the back door, can you? No, it's been work for us. Yeah. Acknowledge that God is the only shepherd. Yes. Be satisfied with that. And you come in, you come in through the front door, Will said, I'm working for it, honestly, <laughs> acknowledging what you've done, that you've strayed, come in, 
through repentance and change. And then all good is available to you. And then remember that you leave. Wherever you are, wherever you've been, you, you, are you leaving goodness and mercy in your path? And then, we'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In the okay, secret I'm, place of the Most High. Yes, it goes back to the 91st Psalm. Dwell there forever. And he said, I thought this was such a good thing. I thought we could have this on the calendar. But he talks about the successful Christian walk is to live in, a, in an awareness of God's presence. That sums it all up. To live aware of God's presence. Live aware of the good shepherd's, shepherd's presence. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Good title. So maybe I will have Bruce end this with Mrs. Eddie's hymn, The Awake. Shepherd, show me how to go o'er the hillside steep, how to gather, how to sow, how to feed thy sheep. I will listen for thy voice, lest my footsteps stray. I will follow and rejoice all the rugged way. Thou wilt bind the stubborn will, wound the callous breast, Make self-righteousness be still. Break earth's stupid rest. Strangers on a barren shore, laboring long and lone, we would enter by the door, and thou knowest thine own. So when day grows dark and cold, tear or triumph harms, lead thy lambkins to the fold. Take them in thine arms. Feed the hungry. Heal the heart till the morning's beam. White as wool ere they depart. Shepherd, wash them clean. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you all. Yeah, Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.